I'm Peggy Little, a longtime member of the Executive Committee of the Litigation Section of the Federalist Society. I want to do a little plug for our section. If for, for any of you looking for leadership op opportunities, the lit litigation section is the most fun section. Uh, today we have organized a fine panel, and my job is to introduce the topic and our moderator. The topic is, is the National Association of Attorneys General in need of reform? Moderating this panel today on this precious, pressing issue is the Honorable Stefanos Bibas. Judge Bibas is a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. He has taught law at the University of Pennsylvania and several other law schools, argued six cases before the Supreme Court, and has filed briefs in dozens of other cases. Uh, Judge Bibas also um, clerked on the Fifth Circuit and at the Supreme Court, and he had, was involved in some private practice, followed by serving as an assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of New York, where he successfully prosecuted the world's leading expert in Tiffany stained glass for hiring a grave robber to steal the priceless Tiffany windows from cemeteries. I want to hear more about that sometime. <clears throat> and uh, I, I want to add a personal note as to Judge Bebas. For all of the young lawyers here today, I cannot recommend a better way to learn both the art and the craft of legal writing than to read his decisions, which are models of concision, clarity, and persuasive authority. Judge Bebas. Thank you for that generous introduction. Thank you to the litigation uh, practice group for organizing this wonderful panel. Uh, is the National Association of Attorneys General in need of reform? Uh, before we begin, one brief announcement about CLE. For those of you pursuing CLE, uh, to get credit, you need to sign in and out once a day each day. You can do that by scanning the QR codes, the CLE QR codes. So if you haven't checked in and you want CLE, please be sure to scan the QR codes that you should have been handed in registration, or feel free to grab a QR code from one of our volunteers who are standing over here ready to help. If you already checked in via QR code, there's no need to check in again. So the National Association of Attorneys General, affectionately known as NAG, is a nonpartisan organization founded in 1907. It facilitates interaction among the 56 state attorneys general and territory attorneys general. Uh, it's supposed to, quote, provide a community for attorneys general and their staff to collaboratively address issues important to their work, as well as training and resources su to support attorneys general in protecting the rule of law in the US Constitution. But recently, it's come under criticism for holding assets that far outstrip its operating budget an annual operating budget of five million, but holding on to assets of almost 300 million. Most of this money comes from uh, taking part in public enforcement litigation and uh, settlements, and some say that these funds belong to the states, not to this intermediary organization. The association has been publicly accused of tacking to the left and failing to fulfill its bipartisan mission, and I'm sure we're gonna hear both sides of that uh, issue or, or dispute as well. So our topic is, is the National Association of Attorneys General in need of reform. But first, let me introduce our speakers. So first, we'll hear from Jonathan Scrimetti to my far right. Mr. Scrimetti currently serves as uh, Tennessee's 28th Attorney General. He was just sworn in two months ago. Congratulations uh, on your new position. Previously, he was Tennessee's uh, Governor's Chief Counsel. He worked as a federal prosecutor, prosecuted a surprising number of white supremacist plots, against federal and local officials. He was in private practice in Memphis. He earned his JD from Harvard, clerk for Judge Stephen Colleton on the Eighth Circuit, and was an adjunct professor at the University of Memphis Law School, and most importantly, is the proud father of four lovely children. Next, we'll hear from O.H. Skinner. Uh, Mr. Skinner is executive director of the Alliance for Consumers. It's an organization dedicated to, quote, ensuring that consumer protection efforts and attorney general enforcement actions are consistent with the rule of law and benefit everyday consumers. Before that, he was Arizona Solicitor General 
and he argued before the U.S. Supreme Court, led the state's consumer protection litigation against Google, Volkswagen, and others. He's graduated from Harvard Law School and then clerked for Judge J.L. Edmondson on the 11th Circuit and was in private practice in Boston. And finally, we have Mr. Chris Toth, to my immediate left. He began serving as executive director of NAG uh, five years ago. He just retired about five months ago from it. Uh, he'll be able to give us an insider's perspective on the association. Before that, he had worked as NAG's deputy executive director since 2004. He got his bachelor's from NYU, graduated from the Naval Aviation Officer Candidate School. My son is already starstruck and wants to get some career advice from you, uh, and earned his JD at Notre Dame. He's a decorated veteran, having served as an officer on active duty and in the reserves for both Army and Navy. He's also a master gardener and master naturalist, and he's completed 12 marathons, which I believe is exactly 12 more than I have <laughs> So, Mr. Scrimetti will start off by talking about the need for a neutral forum for AGs to communicate and the, the need for critical mass of AGs, and then Mr. Skinner will talk to us about NAG's salutary purpose as bipartisan, but some ethical and liability questions about the way that it's been structured and funded. And then we'll have Mr. Toth talk about the misconceptions about NAG, how it uses funds, about transparency and, and bipartisanship. So, uh, ask each of you to start for five to eight minutes, and then we'll have some back and forth, and then we will welcome some questions from the audience. Mr. Scrimetti, why don't you kick it off? Thank you, Judge. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about why NAG is necessary. There is an inherent logic in the structure of complex mass litigation involving states that's going to push us toward reinventing NAG if we get rid of it. It fills a space uh, that it has to fill. Now, there is ample room for reform. I'm not going to get into details on that right now. But I want to give you some understanding of the dynamics at play and the reason that NAG or something NAG-like has to be there. Uh, NAG was founded in 1907 when the attorneys general of the various states got together, uh, well, individually bumping heads into the Standard Oil Company. There was, as you would expect, a massive resource asymmetry between each individual state and one of the most powerful companies in American, if not global, history. Uh, the AGs realized that they were not going to be able to do this individually, but that if they pooled resources, they were addressing the same problems there was room for them to stack up, uh, to have people take various pieces of the cases and work together to multiply uh, their effectiveness. That dynamic continues to this day in various cases. Uh, there are a broad variety of multi-state cases that are organized uh, by the states, typically through the channels that NAG creates. So NAG doesn't run multi-state litigation, but it acts as a convener and provides the infrastructure in which the states can talk. In any given multi-state case, you're gonna have some states that are the lead states, some states that are on the executive committee that have a, a lesser but still very significant leadership role, and then a large number of states that are typically along for the ride. They may have one lawyer working part-time on some of the issues, um, but you know, ordinarily, it's a, a division of resources where there are a few states that are doing the bulk of the work. Uh, in the really big cases, there is no way we could do it absent that or contracting out. Uh, it, it's just too complicated. Uh, you know, I, I cut my teeth in this world as one of the negotiators in the opioids litigation, which the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, and the New York Times have all identified as the most complicated litigation in American history. Uh, the states were involved, the plaintiff's bar was involved, you had multiple very large companies with a very large effect on the American economy and the healthcare sector. And it got very complicated. Uh, and the states would not have been able to represent the interests of their people if we were trying to do it piecemeal one at a time. Uh, and there are, there are structural incentives, not just for the states who get the efficiency of, of being able to uh, pool resources to work on the same issues, uh, there's also an incentive here for defendants to have a unified forum with which to converse. If you had 50 states going after a defendant, that's 50 opportunities to litigate discovery, that's 50 streams of discovery requests coming in, you're in 50 state courts. Uh, obviously, there is a huge inefficiency trying to litigate each piece along the way. Sometimes it happens, it's very expensive. If you have all the states working in concert, 
you have an opportunity to secure global peace much more efficiently. Uh, the states working together can talk with each other, find a consensus position that satisfies typically most, not quite all of the states, uh, and, and offer to resolve all of the liability with the states. Now, that dynamic is complicated because we're not just looking at the states and the really big pieces of litigation anymore. Uh, there are also municipalities and counties that are litigating separately. In some states, the state attorney general has the authority to resolve cases on behalf of both the state and state political subdivisions. In most states, that is not the case. And you have a trial bar that's been squeezed by tort reform and looking for new entrepreneurial opportunities that's realized they can come in and represent these municipalities, and that gives them a chance to get a seat at the table in these very large dollar cases. Uh, and so what you see happening uh, in both the really big cases and the smaller cases, but my focus is on the necessity of NAG in the, in the very large cases is, you have these trilateral negotiations where you'll have the states looking to represent the state interests and get a resolution that benefits the people of those states. You have the companies looking to resolve liability. And then you have the plaintiff's bar representing a very, very large inventory of municipalities. Now, as you can imagine, most of these municipalities and counties are not often involved in huge, sophisticated litigation. Uh, they are approached with a pitch saying, hey, there's money on the table, you should get your piece of it, let us represent you. The, the big players here will get inventories of hundreds of political subdivisions. As a result of that, uh, there's not a lot of control or oversight exercised by the subdivisions. They're just not in a position to do that. If you're a, a semi-rural county somewhere, you're not gonna be actively involved typically in the course of this litigation. Uh, the plaintiff's lawyers, meanwhile, are extraordinarily sophisticated. They are repeat players in this system. They are very effective at what they do. Um, and then there's, there's a significant difference in incentives that creates a lot of friction during this process. The plaintiff's lawyers are interested in getting money for their clients and obviously concomitantly with that money for themselves. It's a, a very one-dimensional approach to resolving the cases. But in these huge cases we're talking about, there are a lot of potential collateral effects. When we were looking at the uh, pharmaceutical distributors, we were dealing with companies that distribute approximately 90% of the prescription drugs in the United States. If something had gone wrong in those negotiations and we broke the companies, I mean, the, we don't say it flippantly. I mean, there's a high likelihood that some people would have died as a result of that. It would have been a huge disruption uh, to the health care of people in our states. And so there are, there are factors that don't relate to the money that are very important, where the states, because they're taking into account the interests of the people, uh, qua the people, and where there's political accountability, uh, sometimes indirectly, but uh, you know, they're, they're always answering to somebody for what they're doing, the states are in a better position to internalize the collateral costs in a way that the plaintiff's bar isn't. And so the states act as a counterweight uh, and it's very important that the states act as collectively as possible to ensure that the state interests aren't swept aside by the purely pecuniary interests. Um, we're seeing more and more of these cases go to bankruptcy court as well. Uh, and there, it is very important for the states to speak with a unified voice. The courts listen to that, uh, and it's an opportunity for us to collectively further represent the interests of our citizens, and again, not just be focused on the monetary outcome. Uh, and in the, in the scale of cases that we're talking about, that's important. Because this is not a situation where you're just trying to squeeze the company, get a bunch of money out of it, they raise their prices a little bit, and they go on. I mean, th this is truly bet the company litigation involving some of the biggest companies in the country. Uh, the, the other issue is, if NAG were to go away, there would be a natural vacuum there. Uh, and there are only a few really obvious candidates to fill that vacuum, and they're all bad. Uh, the first is the Attorney General Alliance, which is a, another all attorneys general organization. It is, um, whereas NAG does not take um, corporate membership money, it, it does have lobbyists come into the meetings, but it's, it's organized by the AGs and it's funded separately. AGA is funded by the corporate interests that are being investigated. And there's a huge incentive there for the companies under investigation to join up. And it does not offer the same type of neutral forum. Uh, there's, there's too much opportunity for the existence of the forum to depend on the goodwill of the people who are under investigation. And so it's not a good vehicle 
for figuring out how to resolve these. Uh, the, the authority could go to the federal government. There are big problems there. You, you're concentrating power in a very small set of hands. Uh, an election could flip it, and then you end up with a lot of inconsistency in the approach. Uh, the FTC does not have the historical institutional competence to deal with these cases the, the same way the state AGs do. Um, and it, there are a lot of localized concerns that would just be swept aside uh, as the feds move. In addition, because there are so many different components of the federal government that are typically implicated in these big cases, there's a lot of sclerosis as the different interests within the federal government try to work themselves out. And so uh, you, you see a very slow resolution process. It can be agonizing getting the buy-in from all the relevant parties. Uh, the plaintiff's bar would be very happy to step in and, and fill the void entirely uh, and just you know, not have to deal with the AGs pushing for something other than as much money as possible coming out of the companies. But I think it's obvious why that's not the best approach. The, the one other potential avenue would be if there was separate consumer protection enforcement done through RAGA and DAGA, which are the Republican Attorney General's Association, the Democratic Attorney General's Association. Uh, I think there are some problems there as well. First of all, these are fundraising organizations, and so you run into the same uh, conflict of interest issue that comes up with the Attorney General Alliance if these were the groups that were involved in this. Second, there is a real interest in as much of a global resolution as possible from the companies in these cases. And if they have to bifurcate negotiations or if you add an entirely different interest at the table, uh, it's gonna really bog things down. There's, there's an efficiency problem there. The other thing is the states working together to build consensus tend, tend to be able to rein in extreme and unreasonable players. If you split it and make it partisan, it's more likely that you're gonna see uh, more extreme positions demanded. And, and that's not to say that we do it perfectly now. I mean, it, the United Nations looks like a stable, quiet, well-run uh, organization compared to the Attorney General, because everybody, I mean, everybody is looking out for their states. There are many uh, political considerations at play um, and lots of, lots of different interests working on different AGs in different ways. So it's hard to get anything approaching a consensus, but without the vehicle of bringing everybody together, without the relationships between the AGs that allow for efficient assembly of these cases, um, you, know, you, you don't have the countervailing pressure on individual AGs to reach a reasonable accommodation. Uh, and if, if we didn't have NAG and had to do this ad hoc every time, it would take forever. Uh, there'd be a lot of political friction, especially now, uh, in getting people to the table. And I recognize that there are very few functional and uh, effective bipartisan entities in the country. Uh, we're in a time of polarization, that's just the way it is. And so anything bipartisan is typically viewed with a great deal of skepticism by both sides. Until recently, the AG community and consumer protection was a pretty functional bipartisan institution. Um, and there were a lot, lot of advantages that flowed from that, both for the states and for the American economy in general. I think it's important that we maintain that. And while there is a need for reform, while there are a lot of opportunities for reform, and while a lot of my colleagues are demanding reform, I mean, if, if there aren't changes, the nag will fracture. Uh, we need to figure out how to keep the critical mass of AGs on board, and that means we're gonna have to change the organization in some significant ways. Uh, but if we fail at that and the organization falls by the wayside, there will be significant consequences. Eventually, we're gonna realize where the structural incentives point us, and we're gonna go through a lot of trouble to reinvent something that's already been around for 115 years. Thank you. So I'll start with a, with a short thing of I, my group exists because I disagree with the last statement made by my very good friend, where he said that until recently, the consumer protection landscape in the states was functional and effective and bipartisan. For what I think you might have heard from a section of that, and that I just fundamentally disagree with, is that the existing bipartisan apparatus that defendants liked because it was a one-stop shop, that trial lawyers were able to work handily with, and that states all bound together in a mushy middle, 
Uh, that was a great outcome. Well, that was a good outcome, I would contend, for the people who were in charge of that operation. And consumers were regularly left out in the cold. It was, when I joined the Arizona Attorney General's office, it was unthinkable that in settling a case, the state would send restitution to consumers in that state. We proposed this as part of our individual one-state Volkswagen diesel settlement after 43 states made no such commitments to their consumers. And that just, as a person coming from, you know, I, I'd moved from Boston to Arizona, and I just thought this just seemed logical to me, but this was unheard of. So what, a fundamental premise that I would say I disagree with is the existing system of NAG bringing everybody together into one place from my perspective, and I've written on this, and there'll be a piece running next week on this, it gathers everybody together, piles them into a bureaucratic quagmire in which, from my perspective, states move incredibly slowly. If you were to ask many defendants in an honest moment or any defense counsel, or you compared it to working at DOJ, the states almost seem like they don't want to settle. You'll have people say, I'd like to discuss term sheets. On a case, now I will say that this often will happen in the mid-sized or large cases, not the mega cases, but we're talking cases that are worth like $100 million. Uh, nobody can get the states to move. It almost feels like they're designed to not move. And a, a ne'er-do-well person would think that maybe states are moving slowly because many of the states that have the most influence at a place like NAG are politically aligned with the municipal governments and the left-wing trial lawyers that are running the other cases where millions and millions and millions of dollars flow and 30% fees are retained and then 99% of those donations at the federal level go back to Democrats. So I don't buy the argument that the centralized function of NAG is itself salutatory. And I will contest that probably on a different panel. But let's accept a version of what you just heard, which is it's very important to have a Kiwanis Club in which the AGs come together and they rent a, a ballroom somewhere, or they don't. Maybe they just get on a conference line, and they call it the National Association of Attorneys General Conference Line, and now they're running their cases. Uh, okay, like I disagree with the value of the centralized structure vehemently. I think it doesn't serve great purposes. I think what you'll see in my piece next week in, uh, is that there's a new trend of, it happens to be conservative states, breaking away and making individualized settlements that I think are moving the ball forward and allowing them to bring a higher cadence of cases, direct more value to their citizens, and break this quagmire, okay? But setting that aside, even if you think that centralized structures are good, NAG is, what you just heard is, you've got this Kiwanis Club organization, this phone line, everybody gets together, it helps them coordinate their cases, they need to work together because that is, okay, what I see at the National Association of Attorneys General starts out the same way. Everybody, it's been around forever. It's an old bipartisan organization. Now immediately some of you will say all bipartisan organizations are just left-wing laundries where left-wing ideas come in, bipartisanship washes over them, and then they come out the exact same, but now they smell a little different. <laughs> I, maybe. But what, you, what I definitely know is it's old, it's bipartisan, it's an institution. You can hate institutions, you can hate bipartisanship, you can love institutions, you can love bipartisanship. So far, we're down to that part. Okay, who are the members of NAG? It's public officials who are the members. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, it has accumulated almost $300 million of assets. Well, how did the Kiwanis Club get $300 million of assets, you ask? Oh, well you see, the public officials settle cases, and when they settle cases, the coordinating body uh, that has a staff of almost 50 people in Washington, D.C., uh, and aren't, you know, government aid uh, employees, uh, receives 15 million here, 100 million there, 40 million here, and over time, that money just gets amassed. And you go, wait, so the Kiwanis Club is getting all this money from public settlements facilitated by a staff that's in D.C.? And it's big, it's like a big staff, like for some of the states that are in this room that I can see, it would be a staff that they would dream of, having 50 extra people. Um, okay, uh, and, and who appoints these staff? Well, they're kind of like appointed over time and like there's not a lot of turnover. Um, oh, so it's like, it's like we made an administrative state in DC for the states and massive amounts of money have flown into it over time. Um, okay, well, what does it do with that money? Well, it lends the money, it invests the money, 
It facilitates trainings. Um, this summer, it helped facilitate retreats for the attorneys general and their spouses to go to London and Berlin and Korea, you know, for the leadership, for the leadership. Uh, okay, well, that's all good. The Kiwanis Club now has almost $300 million, and it's doing the training, and it's doing the lending, and it's doing the facilitation of the cases with a staff that is not really public employees or really accountable in Washington, D.C. Okay, well, so it's, it's kind of acting like a governmental entity, well, what rules apply to it? Do the public records laws apply to it? No, NAG would dispute that it's subject to any state's public records laws. Uh, okay, well, is it subject to legislative oversight? Well, no. You see, it's in Washington, D.C., and it's the Kiwanis Club. It's not the government. Uh, well, does it have limits on how it can invest its money that's subject to state law? Well, no, it has investments in hedge funds and in private equity and in foreign stocks. Oh, well, is it complying with the new wave of ESG limits on how state money can be invested? Well, no, you see, it's the Kiwanis Club, it's not the government. Um, so as I work down this, I think you can see that I don't buy the idea that the centralized structure itself is good. But even if you do buy the idea that the centralized structure is good, this should feel deeply strange to you as a person who's come to the Federal Society. It is the kind of thing where I have big problems. Um, this feels very simple to me. Do we ever want government alter ego organizations to get set up, stuffed full of hundreds of millions of dollars from public cases with the white hat of we are just facilitating the good governance of the world, but we are not subject to any of the rules that would come with being the government? I think if you've spent years at Federal Society meetings, it might feel like I'm describing a version of the administrative state. It's good and convenient to have a thing that writes the rules so Congress doesn't have to. It's good and convenient for an unelected agency head to be able to, or committee, to be able to issue rules that the president kind of like is in charge of, but not really, but see like who's really responsible for that. Yeah, I mean, these are the same arguments that you've heard for the administrative state, for the unelected bureaucracy, for unaccountable commissions, and I just don't buy that. I just don't think that good things come from that. I don't think it's shocking that you see trips to Europe for AGs and their spouses uh, for leadership retreats when no accountability really exists in this organization. Um, and I, I just think that is the, I think that that set of core things really is what rubs me the wrong way. In addition to the fact that I think the existing system for consumer protection disserved consumers and should be broken. Uh, but beyond that, I, the defenses that you hear, so all of this just to me, if you come to a FedSoc conference, you're hearing, oh, this is how people defend the administrative state. This is how people defend unaccountable bureaucracy. This is how people defend making decisions outside of what we would normally say a separation of powers. Um, this is how people defend the creation and operation of the CFPB. You see, if you just remove all the strings, it'll all go great because I'm doing the Lord's work over here. And I don't buy it. And when you have defenses like, well, it's bipartisan, I'm unmoved by that. Uh, I'm just unmoved by the concept that something that feels like a weird, shady, money-moving operation and outside of the government is okay if it's a shady, bipartisan <laughs> operation. Um, and I truly mean that. Like, I think that that just doesn't, that doesn't move my concerns. Um, a lot of the criticism from NAG has come from conservative AGs. I think those conservative AGs are doing groundbreaking work in consumer protection, right? But I think that the problems at NAG are not necessarily a partisan issue. Um, okay, transparency. I just, I just beg to differ that there's any transparency here at NAG. Uh, NAG is a nonprofit that doesn't file a 990 because it has an IRS declaration that says that it is an instrumentality of the states, but it's not subject to legislative oversight, public records compliance, budget requirements, joint budget committees, or any of the rules that would come with government. So it's just uh, an alter ego existing in free space in between both worlds, claiming the benefits of both worlds and none of the costs. Uh, and, you know, I just, I just don't think that that should be how we run government. I definitely don't think that's how state AGs should be operating. 
and I don't think it serves consumers, everyday people in the States, because that's how we built the system that has gotten us to where all of us assume that we're not gonna benefit from state settlements. Why is it that states are so slow? Why is it that states don't seem to be on the cutting edge and they're always sitting at the table with trial lawyers? I just think nag. I mean, one simple example, John and I, this is a core disagreement as very good friends, you know, we both have the same problems. I don't think that when municipal claims and, and class action claims settle first and the lawyers take 30% of the money and feed it into left-wing politics, that is a feature. I think that is a problem. Jonathan thinks that NAG can help stop that. I don't. And one fact I will cite is that the NAG Consumer Protection Conference that was here in DC last week, by my really rough count, there were over a dozen left-wing trial lawyers from major DC political shops and that damn near outnumbered the number of conservative staff at this event. And so if NAG is the solution to the trial lawyers, why are the trial lawyers so happy to come to NAG? Um, but anyway, so that's, to me, I dispute the benefits of NAG, but even if you accept the benefits of NAG, I don't see the same world that he just described. I see something that feels very, very outside the box in a way that should make all of you who've spent any number of years here feel deeply uncomfortable and see red flags everywhere as a first principles matter, as an ethics matter, as a good governance matter, as a like belief in the rule of law matter. None of this should make you feel good, uh, even if the end result is overlook it all, it's in furtherance of goodness. And let's hear from Mr. Toth on the insider perspective. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a, and a sincere thank you to the Federalist Society for inviting me. It's a real privilege to be here, and it's a real honor to be here with my uh, three uh, fellow panelists, uh, great individuals, and, and particularly Jonathan Scrimetti. Congratulations on your recent appointment as Tennessee AG. As, um, and I mentioned this to you earlier, but Tennessee very, very well may have the finest line of attorneys general uh, of any state in the union. So you really inherit a great position with great predecessors. And I will say that the, uh, one of the best conversations I've ever had at NAG was sitting next to you at a chief deputies conference where we talked about future NAG work in the area of cyberspace and in emerging technologies, and you had some great ideas, and, and we look forward to your leadership with NAG and, and those, uh, those arenas, so thank you. All right, I think the value that I can bring to this panel is talking about how NAG really works. Um, for 18 years, I took the metro, I got off at Farragut North, walked four blocks to NAG office, and I know how NAG works, and so I think that that's the benefit to provide you. There's been a lot of misconceptions um, a lot of confusion about the way NAG really operates. So I'm going to talk about what is NAG, how is it governed. I'm going to talk about multi-states, because I think that will clarify a lot of the confusion here. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the funds, their purpose, uh, who they serve, how they serve them. So first of all, as OH mentioned, NAG is not a 501c3. It is considered by the federal government an instrumentality of the states. And it's a very unique designation that probably only two or three organizations other than NAG have in this country. Uh, NAG is governed by the AGs, not by the staff. It has a 12-person executive committee, basically its board of directors, which is bipartisan. And its composition varies from year to year. Uh, in 2020, we finished a succession of three consecutive Republican attorneys general, and during that time, the board of directors for NAG was either 9-3 or 8-4 Republican. NAG is just finishing uh, two Democrat presidents in a row, and during this time, NAG has been about 7-5 Democrat. It would be 6-6 six, six, uh, RD if not for the fact that a, a Republican attorney general who was scheduled to join the board in June was impeached and removed from office. So there's a lot of effort that goes into making sure, as much as possible, the board is bipartisan. And there was a long effort that worked for many years, and, and John, I think this is one of the reforms that I hear is being taken in terms of the rotation of the presidency, and I think it's a good one. As I mentioned, we had three Republican presidents in a row, and now uh, two Democrat. But before that, both my predecessor and myself were able to successfully ensure that there was a Democrat and Republican 
rotation, RD, 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 and it worked for many, many years, and I think NAG needs to put that in its constitution, so that does happen, in fact. Um, so, moving on to multi-states. Now, the way I'm going to use multi-states, I'm going to use it shorthand for bipartisan multi-state lawsuits. I'm not here to, de to, to defend partisan uh, multi-states, that either the R's or D's bring. Some of them have good points, some of them have good objectives. Uh, some of them are legally irresponsible, and occasionally there's a few that I think are even ethically irresponsible. NAG doesn't get involved in that world, and, and the funds that NAG has, resources that NAG has, will never be used to support partisan multi-states or any partisan activity whatsoever. But NAG does support um, bipartisan multi-state lawsuits. Now, Attorney General Scarametti. Just a couple of examples of what a multi-state looks like for those of us who aren't sure. in this world. Sure. Well, of course, the big, the big multi-states over the past 20 years have included uh, the lawsuit against Big Tobacco, which resulted in master settlement agreement, the multi-state in the mortgage fraud uh, crisis, and the big one now, which is some of it's reached its conclusion, some of it is reaching its conclusion, is with uh, the opioids. But at any given time, there could be, there could be several dozen multi-states going on. Let me talk a little bit about the structure, because I think this is important, because there's a lot of talk about how NAG, whatever that means, whether it means the staff or whether it means the executive committee, is deeply involved in multi-states. Now, let me say this up front. NAG staff do not participate in multi-state discussions on settlements. They simply provide basically administrative support. They schedule conference calls at the request of the multi-state co-chairs, and they will also schedule meetings when there is a request for grants from some of NAG's investigative funds. NAG itself does not get involved in litigation. NAG is not a party to any of the multi-state lawsuits going on. All of those multi-states are brought by the AGs in their individual and sovereign capacity. Now, in multi-states, they come together to work collectively together, but they're still sovereign entities. A multi-state will start where a particular AG or two will ident identify some harm being done to their constituents. And then if they re realize a harm is uh, affecting other states as well, they will have discussions with other AGs. Eventually, they'll decide to start a multi-state investigation, and sometimes it's only 12 states, but more often than not, it's 40, 45, or even 50 states. So these multi-states have strong bipartisan support, and once again, they're the, the only actions that NAG even provides administrative support for. The multi-states will form an executive committee, and that's actually, more often than not, elected. Usually the lead states end up that are on the executive committee of the multi-state, not to be confused with the NAG executive committee, but the lead states are those states that either have cons uh, robust consumer protection departments or they're states that have been particularly harmed by the uh, offenses of, of the people that are being investigated and sued. And then they will that, that executive committee will work on a settlement, getting the input from all the members. And like any settlement, there's some give and take. Not everybody's going to be happy, but eventually the executive committee will come up with something that they think they can get an agreement on. And here's the important thing, and I think it's being lost in all these attacks on NAG and all these discussions. It's certainly lost on some of the AGs that have attacked NAG. Once there is a decision that this is going to be the settlement, by that multi-state, every AG has the ability to walk away. And some do. Some AGs don't even join a multi-state to begin with. Uh, Oklahoma, for instance, went its own way. It was only state to go its own way on the mortgage fraud crisis. Oklahoma also went their own way on Purdue Pharma, and they took it to trial. Every AG is a sovereign actor. They cannot be forced or compelled by NAG, however you define that, or by their peers to join any multi-state lawsuit. It just can't happen. So this leads me to the McKinsey case, and I, I bring McKinsey up because McKinsey has been used as a bloody towel to wave at NAG about, gee, this is, this is an example of everything that's wrong at NAG. And 
one of the lines of attack. Our audience doesn't know what, what is McKinsey being sued over. McKinsey uh, was being sued over their involvement in the opioid crisis. Thank you, Judge. And the, con the consulting they were doing to some of the own opioid manufacturers and distributors. So the McKinsey case uh, was settled and it received unanimous support from all the states that were part of that multi-state settlement. But one of the things that was used against NAG is that NAG received $15 million from this settlement. Why is NAG getting $15 million when uh, I only got $9 million or $10 million for my state? First thing, NAG received $15 million and, and um, no other way than when your bank receives your paycheck, it's actually receiving it. It's completely analogous to that. NAG staff, NAG's board, had no say in the multi-state settlement in McKinsey. There was $15 million that was set aside, about half of it, to repay a grant to one of NAG's investigative funds. That grant was requested by the states to the NAG committee, which is all AGs, and, and they asked for approximately seven and a half million dollars to support that litigation. One of the terms, and, and this gets back to AG oversight of everything that's done at NAG, one of the terms of requesting a grant from the, ver the two main NAG investigative committees is you have to repay it if you're successful. Because otherwise, how do you sustain these grants? So the litigation was successful. So part of that was just repaying a grant that the states that requested that money used and agreed to pay back. And the other half was used to establish a document repository for opioid litigation. Now, I wasn't part of the, 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 uh, the negotiations. I can't give you the details on the repository. It was modeled after the tobacco document repository when tobacco, Big Tobacco was sued in 1998. But that was the decision of the deciding states to set that repository up. And the first, as an example, I heard about it was when I got an email saying, you've got $15 million on your way, set up a couple accounts for them, pay, repay the grant, and set aside an account for this money, and we will direct its use later. That's coming from the AGs. So NAG didn't receive $15 million. This was a decision by the AGs. And you know, the, the first state AG who pulled out of NAG in 2021 raised McKinsey as his principal reason for withdrawing from NAG. But every single state agreed to those terms. I didn't agree to them because I don't participate in multi-states. But every single AG that was part of that multi-state agreed to those terms. And the AG that was complaining about McKinsey agreed to those terms and even issued a press release bragging about the McKinsey settlement. And by the way, I, I think this is worth noting at the same time this AG was pulling out a snack, they were requesting a grant from one of the investigative funds. So the point I'm trying to make here, before I just talk about funds briefly, is that the AGs are the ones that run NAG. And I mean, OH mentioned that there's somehow that the NAG staff has turned into administrative state and they're all here in DC. That's actually not the case. Uh, NAG staff are from all over the country and work from all over the country. We, we started hiring from all over the country way before even COVID happened because the entire country became our talent pool. So there's staff in Texas, Idaho, uh, Pennsylvania, Florida, Indiana, Kentucky, New York, Illinois, from all over the place. So there, please rest assured, there's not a cabal of less leftist DC citizens uh, running NAG. And to that end too, since politics was brought up, I think NAG is a remarkable institution and that one of the, the, the last thing a person hears in their interview to get a position at NAG and the last thing they hear when they get a position in their entrance interview is to check your politics at the lobby door. We serve both Republicans and Democrats. Check your politics at the lobby door. Don't, don't wear campaign buttons to work. Don't be having political arguments at NAG leave that at the lobby door, and the NAG staff has been extremely honorable about it. I think the irony is that where I think many organizations within DC have become politicized, NAG is the model of an organization where its staff has not become politicized. And finally, I wanna to touch on these funds. So um, the figures now become 300 million. I don't think it ever got above 280 million. I don't have 
access anymore to NAG's portfolio. I would imagine with the market downturns, it's, it's, it's probably considerably less. But real quick, how did that money come about? First of all, after the, ma the uh, master settlement agreement was signed, about 100, 100, 100 to about 110 million at, at the last count of that came from a 501c3 being set up called the NAG Mission Foundation. So that's not even governed by NAG, that's an independent 501c3, and again, every AG, Republican and Democrat, consented to that foundation being set up. And that foundation was set up to support training and research at NAG, and also to provide a backstop for the tobacco settlement. About 70 million of it was set up by the Master Settlement Agreement to provide litigation support for the uh, tobacco settlement. So that has a designated purpose. The remainder of it, about 35 million of it, is the NAG Tree Endowment, and that is set up to support training and research that is provided at no cost to AG staff around the country. There was a time where there was very little training available for AG staff, and I hear the noise, so I'm gonna speed this up. Um, but what's happening now is the NAG for the last 15 years has been able to provide training at no cost because of that fund to AG staff around the country, and trained up to 20,000 individuals just a couple years ago. And there are two investigative funds, but once again, they were set up with unanimous consent of all the AGs, Republican and Democrat, with the idea that the AGs needed some funds to try to level the playing field with big business. Let me be clear here, the AGs are the underdogs when they take on big business. Big business has pockets that are far deeper than the AGs could ever draw on. But AGs are the underdogs. And in multi-state lawsuits, bipartisan multi-state lawsuits, good companies don't get sued, quite frankly. This isn't a matter, as the chamber would have you think it, that good companies are being sued and bullied by NAG. If you get into the type of trouble that 40, 45, 50 AGs of both parties are going to sue you, you've done something pretty bad, whether it's the opioid manufacturers, whether it's big tobacco lying about um, the health effects of smoking. So I'll just close on this. Institutions are important, and there's been a lot of attack on institutions in general. And yes, every institution needs to be reformed and, can, and needs to continue to be reformed. But part of whether you're a human being or whether you're an organization, you figure out the things that work and you keep them, you figure out the things that are not working and you change them. But institutions are important, no matter how much reform they need or don't need. NAG's working. It's working in providing free training to AG staff around the country and making them much better at what they do and making them better able to prosecute corruption, to enforce consumer protection laws, whatever the case is. And institutions really are the, are the skeleton of which the flesh of our democracy is built around. And once you tear an institution down, it's really hard to, to build it back up. So yes, anything can be reformed, and I have full confidence that AGs like Jonathan Scrimetti of such character and intelligence will do a good job in creating whatever reforms need to be had. But let's remember, I hear what OH is saying, but it, AGs control everything that is done at NAG through the board, through various committees, and the staff takes their marching orders from the AGs. So institutions are important, and if you lose them, it's hard to get them back. Thank you. Let me give each panelist a chance to briefly respond to things that have been said since, since he spoke. Mr. Uh, General Scrimetti. Thank you, Judge. I want to say first, I am mortally wounded by OH's comparison of this to the administrative state. I, I knew that would hurt, I hurt you. Mortally that wounded. That would hurt you deeply. I came into office with a, a list of things I wanted to do, including reinvigorate the non-delegation doctrine, overturn Wickard versus Filburn, make sure that the spending clause is appropriately enforced. So I mean, that, that hurts, that hurts. You're welcome. 
Well, what we're really talking about here is a contract negotiation. It's a contract with a bunch of different parties. And I'm going to limit what I say to the mega cases that OH talked about. And opioids is an example. In opioids, I assure you, we did not all want to be at the table together. The plaintiff's lawyers would much rather we not have been there. We would much rather they not have been there. We were stuck together because everybody had a finger on the nuclear trigger. Uh, the exposure was so big in those cases that if there wasn't a global resolution of liability that involved virtually everybody, there was room for a little bit of defection from some of the states, especially if it wasn't one of the larger states. There was room for a little bit of defection from some of the municipalities that the plaintiff's bar had. But if there was any sort of cascade of people actually going to trial in these cases, all the companies would have gone into bankruptcy. Uh, we would have been in bankruptcy court. There would have been a huge disruption to the American economy, to the health care provision in the United States. It would have been really bad. And yes, the market would have solved for that eventually, but there are real human costs to that hiccup. And there's a big, a big just loss of money if we don't handle these things efficiently. The other issue is when we're spinning up a multi-state and everybody's working together to streamline discovery, that's because you're asking for basically the same stuff. Now, if you have 50 groups of lawyers doing their own discovery requests, there are going to be differences. The variations are going to cost a lot of money to resolve on the part of everybody who's getting those requests. Uh, if we do a common interest agreement, that's not the administrative state. That's us doing things more efficiently, which seems to be uh, important for the government to do. And this isn't the kind of efficiency where it's like, oh, well, if we have to go to Congress, then that's just a pain, so we're just going to do it ourselves. This is 50 sovereigns agreeing to work together to accomplish essentially the same end in the most efficient mechanism possible. The one last thing I will say is there's a federalism component here. The AGs are more effective, the state AGs are more effective when they work together. That lets them more effectively assert the state interests in the broader system that we have. If the states are, are fractured and they're not able to consolidate their efforts, that empowers the federal government. Uh, and then we have more concentrated power. And I think everybody in this room knows that that's just the fundamental cause of bad government. Uh, you know, We have a crazy system involving a lot of separate sovereigns pursuing a lot of different interests. We need that system. It's a good system. Within the confines of that system, voluntary cooperation can be efficient and effective, and it is a good thing in many circumstances. Mr. Skinner. Yeah, so I think it's important to, to accept and set aside this first, I would say, dis, this point of long-running discussion between Jonathan and I, who are long friends. I don't see as much value in everybody working together in most cases, but let's I don't think that necessarily has all the values. But let's just work past that to, even if everybody should be on the same phone line together, what is the thing that is so odd here? It's this neither fish nor fowl thing that has been built and stuffed full of money. And now you have, and I, I hate to try to seem younger than I am, it's the Spider-Man meme. It's the staff at NAG saying, well, I don't know how those hundreds of millions of dollars got here. Like, we aren't a party to the case, except for the part where we get all the money from the case, which, I mean, I hear that. Then you have the AGs who will tell you that trying to, trying to bureaucratically be the board governing, because saying nobody at NAG, none of the board members of NAG were members of these cases, I, I don't know if you meant that. The AGs who are negotiating the settlements are the board members for NAG. This is the third party payments from DOJ, but to an organization in which Loretta Lynch and Eric Holder and Barack Obama are the board. That's weird. Uh, so they're pointing the fingers back and being like, how did, how did this all happen? I think it really it just comes down to accountability that was mentioned. Um, you know, look, the accountability is missing in all of the key ways that I think accountability should exist. Uh, there are only, there are plenty of instrumentalities of the state as declared by the IRS that exist out there. Uh, I think it's far more than two or three. Let's just use like the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, right? It's like kind of governmental, it's also kind of not governmental, it carries out a thing across state lines. But here's the thing, it was set up by the legislature and given power and then it went to the IRS and said, can I not file a 990 because I'm kind of the government? Okay, well NAG wasn't set up by the legislature. There is a legislature in each one of these states, they didn't appropriate money to NAG. 
In fact, I would say that the money being sent to NAG was specifically to avoid the legislature. And having, in Arizona, we have a revolving fund that can fund cases, and I know not every state does, but like, that's the answer. Or if you think NAG is so deeply salutatory, just get your legislature to appropriate money for it, and now we're having a fundamentally different conversation. We're having much more of the first conversation. Is a self-convening organization full of money important? But we don't have that. And I think that you know, the Mission Foundation is a separate C3. The sole member of the Mission Foundation is NAG, right? It's, it's like, it's just, it's, this is just a thing where if the legislatures appropriated money to set up a New York, New Jersey multi-semi-governmental body that holds money and can lend money and that is somehow like accountable to a comptroller or a treasurer or an auditor or the state legislative budget committee, now we're just having a question of like that, I would say that's actually more analogous to the administrative state at the federal government level. This is like three standard deviations away from that. A public official sets up a sidecar entity that is run by staff that are not employed by the state but are instead employed by public settlements with no legislative budget oversight committee, auditor committee. It invests money, it lends money, it purports to have no role in these cases, but yet has binding contracts requiring repayment from the states. Like, I just, everyone is pointing fingers at everybody, and I'm not here to tell you who's good. I am here to tell you that even if you think a convening organization is deeply beneficial, NAG should release the hundreds of millions of dollars that it has and is investing and serve that purpose. The last thing I will note that is, I think, uh, two, two notes. The McKinsey opioid settlement is instructive because you heard about how there's an executive committee and then there's passengers in a case. I think that's kind of a fair description. The McKinsey opioid settlement is negotiated by a 10-state multi-state executive committee. Eight Democrats, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, North Carolina, Oregon, and Vermont. Two Republicans, Oklahoma, and your predecessor in Tennessee. When they negotiate a $650 million deal and then say, oh, at the very end, the 15 million is going to go to NAG. Yes, everyone can walk away. But you now have, for all of these elected officials, a $650 million deal where the problem with it feels like a rounding error. But it's not surprising that over the course of time, that pebble grew in their shoe and they did not think that that was a fair way to do this or that that was a normal, equitable, bipartisan negotiation. It doesn't surprise me, and I think that was what you see time and time again. Another thing I will say is these multi-states, we're talking about mega cases. My concerns with these are they just settled a Ford truck capacity multi-state that I just always like talking about because it was around when I came into the Attorney General's office. I left five years later, it was still around. I have now been in my new job for over two years and it just settled for $19 million across 50 states. About model year 2011 trucks. I think that's the problem to me. And that's your average multi-state. I think there's over 50 of them happening right now. So occasionally we talk about opioids or we talk about you know, uh, tobacco and you gotta remember that there's hundreds of cases in the meantime that are dragging on for a decade with an executive committee that is being entirely driven by a few states <laughs> and then negotiating deals and giving take it or leave it deals and sending money to NAG. So uh, the last thing I would say is I don't, I have my own questions about the value of the way that NAG does its training, but I will just note this one thing from the NAG website. Most faculty of NAG tree are AG staff from AG offices. And when you look at the trainings, it's repeatedly the biggest overstaffed offices in coastal cities doing Zoom trainings or flying around the country teaching other states how to, I would say, think like everybody the same. And I think that that existing system is not good and doesn't serve a good purpose. Uh, I don't think it means bad, I just think it doesn't serve good purposes. Anyway, I'll just end with saying, at the end of the day, the states all get together and decide to pour a bunch of money through the normal legislative approval process into something that has actual government oversight and like somehow run consumer protection that way, I think we're having a different conversation. But they didn't. And this thing is pretending to be uh, both everything and nothing at the same time, 
while shepherding a quarter billion dollars. And I think that is a very big problem. Thank you, Judge. A little bit more about the investments. Why are, why are these amounts so big? So NACTRI Endowment, for instance, has $35 million. Sounds like a ton of money. But if you use it all at once, you're not going to be able to train people for very long. So the way the NAG operates, whether it's the things that the Mission Foundation funds, like training, or the NACTRI Endowment funds, uh, training and research, only the investment income from that is used. And the idea is this, and I think this is the a consummate form of good stewardship is that when you have funds like this and you only use the investment income, that means those funds will be there as long as there is a NAG and as long as there is a United States to make AG staff better at what they do. So that's why the funds are as big as they are. It's just like a, a, a university endowment in some ways and that you use the investment income that, so that in perpetuity you can provide free trainings free moot courts, and, a, and an incredible amount of other services as well. Um, and an issue with these funds, uh, I wasn't there for the creation of most of them, but as I said, they were all done with the unanimous consent of all the AGs. So to the, to the extent that, OH, you have a problem with these funds, then, you know, it's like for whom do, does a bell toll? I mean, the AGs agreed to set up these funds. And there was no dissent for the ones that were created while I was there. There was no dissent. Everybody thought it was a great idea because they liked the idea. We want to have something so that five AGs from now, NAG can still be providing these services. So that's part of it. Um, and then the other issue is, I, I, OH, you wrote an article that said that my successor should uh, be worried about a knock on the door where people want these, uh, where states want these monies back. Well, the first thing my successor is going to do is say, I don't have the authority to do anything with these settlements. You have to talk to the NAG executive committee. So if there is a knock on the door, there's not much that Brian Kane is going to be able to do to respond to that. But here's an important point, too. Whether you think it was a good or a bad idea, all these settlements and all these funds were set up. And now they exist as part of court orders. So every, and, and there's dozens of court orders that are involved here. So the idea of the states trying to get the money back is kind of, kind of, it, it's dead at the beginning. Because that would require all the participants in all these settlements to go back to the court and say, we changed our mind. And let's be realistic, that simply is not going to happen. Whether you think it should happen or not, whether it's a good thing or not, it, it just simply isn't going to happen. So I think that's an argument that only takes you down a rabbit hole and it, and it doesn't create anything substantive. But I want to emphasize, these monies are being used for good Things. They are improving the institution of attorneys general. They are making both them and their staff better at what they do. And it's not only them. It's about them now, and it's about AGs in the future. So let me... Can I, can I uh, get brief? I think, so I think this is now that... Because we have a bunch of nerds in the room. So I think a core thing here is it's not shocking. I mean, the idea that AGs have created... It, a perpetual capital pool. <laughs> like that, I think that just proves my point. But on this last point, I think this is really interesting. Uh, NAG set up, the, these funds have been set up with NAG through various court settlements um, in which private party, it, parties come to the judge and say, we're sending all this money around, sign this off. Uh, I don't think judges are inclined to say, is the attorney general of some state violating the law of that state by sending money to a third party? They, it's not being raised to them. Uh, but if like Brian Kane, the new executive director of NAG, uh, was driving down the street uh, in a car that said like NAG official business and like ran over like uh, a whole line of school children. And there was a judgment against NAG to the tune of, I don't know, like $100 million. I think NAG defending and saying, sacre bleu, we cannot give you this money. You see 30 years ago, this judge, they gave us this money and they said that we should hold that money. And so the money, you'd, you'd have to go back and like amend the judgment. I think if you were to go back and challenge the legality of giving money to NAG, yeah, you might have to rule 60 that. 
not sure that the private parties that gave the money and were never going to get the money back in any set of circumstances are related party. We could have a discussion about that another day. But if you were to just bring an action today that said, this is public money from a public settlement overseen by public officials, and it's being invested not in compliance with state law or held not in compliance with state law, and every new day is a new violation, and we're not going to dispute how the money got here in the first place or who's liable for what, but you can't hold that anymore. It's not at all clear to me that that is a collateral attack on any sort of judgment. And I wouldn't be surprised to see a state actor of some variety, because keep in mind, uh, it, there's a lot of people who might feel very perturbed about not having oversight of a quarter billion dollars. Because we have a lot of arms of government that are supposed to you know, watch public money. Uh, so I don't think it's a cul-de-sac. It would not surprise me if there are efforts to retrieve the money from NAG, and I think those efforts will be interesting to civil procedure people all across the country. So let me kick off with a few questions, and in about you know, seven, ten minutes, we'll, take, we'll have some time for questions from the audience to so start thinking them up. Um, first one is, you know, there's the cover story, which is this is political in a left-wing sense, and it sounds like there's a, a trial or component, but the deeper problem here sounds like it's more political in the sense of avoiding or having an unusual structure relative to ordinary separation of powers. Now, this gets a little complicated. State constitutions look different from the federal one. They have different internal rules about balanced budgets and funds and things. But is this just another version of the problem with settlements generally, with the consent decrees generally, with the feds having to limit you know, deferred prosecution agreements where the prosecutor directs money to his alma mater or something? Is this just a different iteration, or is there something special here about NAG's involvement that makes it worse? I feel badly saying this because many people in this room or work for AG's offices and are my friends, but I think it's worse. Because if you have a third party payment situation, you're I think that's what you're getting at. But this is a third party payment to an organization controlled by the public officials negotiating the third party payment. At least according to how Chris is describing NAG. And I, look, I've never worked at NAG, so from the outside it feels like NAG staff have a lot more control. Or when you're in an AG's office, Chris is describing how the board is governed and who makes decisions. Mm -hmm. But like, under Chris's universe, this is AG public officials sending money from public settlements to a nonprofit organization that they run. Uh, which is third-party payment plus, like, whiff of self-dealing. Uh, and so I think it's worse. Um, so, uh, you know, did, is there an internal perspective where kind of the top-line story isn't as, the actual story isn't as bad as, as uh, Mr. Skinner's making it out to be? Do you, either of you want to respond to that? So I think... And I'm, I'm not 100% on the history here, but I think this started with the tobacco settlement. Correct. And there was an act of Congress that established, uh, I don't know if it was the Mission Foundation, or, or there, there was an act of Congress that shunted a huge amount of money to NAG and created this fund. And then a lot of mirror funds were set up through a Cypre type process. Now that's, that's something that people have been paying a lot more attention to lately. I, I think at the time, my suspicion is the thinking was, oh, well, it happened in tobacco. This is great. Let's keep doing it here, and we'll, you know, we'll create this fund and this fund. In fact, one of the transparency problems at NAG right now is there are a lot of different funds with different boards, and a lot of people aren't quite sure of exactly what's going on with all the funds and all the money. Uh, I realize there are, there are deeper problems that OH is addressing, but you know, that's, that's certainly something that I've heard about from my colleagues. Um, I think having a better conceptual framework, given some of the work that Arizona did under OH, looking at these settlements and third party payments, uh, I mean, I certainly feel very differently about that than I think I probably would have if I were there 20 years ago and we were just reiterating on what had been done in tobacco. I don't know. I mean, I don't know about the, the moral issue relative to third party payments to other groups. Um, if you're giving money to a group that's got an overtly or implicit political bias and 
you know, they're, they're, you're, you're trying to help your political allies. There may be some more moral culpability there. I think with NAG, because there were the existing structures, I mean, there really is a good faith belief by the people who set these up that this is money that's going to fund additional consumer protection. However, there's been a lot more conversation about state constitutional structures, a lot more people looking at their individual state constitutions, and there are different states that have different problems um, in terms of how this stuff is structured. Some people don't have any problems. Some people have problems related to third-party type payments. Um, some people have uh, other types of structural problems based on uh, prohibitions on debt and how they've been interpreted in their states. Uh, because you're talking about... Can you explain what that is? So, so there are a lot of state constitutions that say the state can't incur a debt or that there are particular mechanisms allowing the state to incur a debt. And depending on how those provisions are written in an individual constitution and how the various state courts have interpreted those provisions in different states, there may be a problem with repaying grant money to NAG for some states that are out there. Uh, I mean, it, it is complicated, right? A state constitutional law is complicated and very underappreciated. This is dealing with some really deep structural issues that I don't think people were really thinking about when all this stuff was established. It's going to take a while to vet through everything uh, and figure out exactly where the problems are because you, you're talking about a 50-state survey plus the territories uh, of these individual constitutions and their provisions. I think as we engage in the reform efforts, and I'm not going to speculate about exactly what's going to happen, but I think a lot of people are very concerned about both the structure and the amount of money involved. Uh, but as we work through that, it, it's going to take a lot of work by each state to figure out what the constitutional limitations are and the statutory limitations are on their ability to participate. But I want to reiterate, even with those complications, there's still a huge incentive to figure out how to work together. Even if there's no money flow other than dues money that pays for getting everybody around a table once or twice a year so they can know each other so when they have to do those calls to get cases going, it's worth it. Um, the relationships have value and maintaining those relationships, even if it's only for one case every few years, if you've got these mega cases, uh, hopefully not coming up too often, so there is real value in people working together. It, it, it seems like actually one thing people aren't talking about is what the role of judges is here, you know, in approving these settlements in CPRE, maybe the bench deserves more responsibility for signing off on these things, maybe we need, you know, devil's advocates or other people to kind of question in the way that people criticize class action settlements generally. We don't have Ted Frank here, but some of these are pathologies. Ted Frank that, right there. All right, all right, okay. Some of these get, are, are, get talked about in other context. Um, but I, I wonder, let me, let me ask you, Mr. Sure. Toth. Um, so there are critics, especially on the right, going around criticizing these universities that build these enormous endowments right. and don't use them and proposing there ought to be some kind of tax on accumulation. Well should the same thing be done here? Is it, is it just gotten accumulated to the point that this ought to be, you know, spent out for the purposes of helping the citizens of these states? Because it does seem like 280 million is still a, a lot more than needed to permanently fund education and some, some documents and things like that. Well, our budget, by the way, our, I'm sorry, old habits die hard. Um, NAG's budget, by the way, is actually closer to about 12 million, not five. So, in fact, all the investment monies are being used. Um, I could, trust me, as NAG's executive director, I wanted to spend just about every dollar, much to my CFO's angst, by the way, to spend every dollar of disposable income we had because our goal was to provide as many services as we can to the attorneys general. So I wanted to make sure that money was put to good use. And I think that makes NAG's ass assets judge, unlike a... Uh, some of the more uh, extravagant university endowments, and that it sounds like aren't being used, but every dollar that can be used that spins off from investment income at NAG is being used. Any other responses? I guess the one thing I do want to say is I don't, I think that this was built by accident, probably. And when I say it has this whiff of self-dealing, I want to be very clear because many of the attorney generals are my personal friends. 
that I don't think they, that was the intention. But I do think that it's hard, you know, and some of this, they signed off, they signed off. It's like amongst the many things in a person's job when somebody comes to you and says, this century old organization has been for the last 30 years running this like lending and, re and repayment game and it's cool, it's great, it's fine. I think when people started growing upset with the liberal tilt, they started asking some core questions like, what exactly is happening here? And how does any of this comply with my state's laws? And then they might have had that oops moment that has happened to maybe all of you who've taken over a job. You realize that maybe your predecessor didn't actually do their homework or think that much about it because it was all for good. Uh, and so I just want to be very clear that like, I think they built a probably not very viable or thing that should exist, but I don't think that it was like this self-dealing. Now, I think it's like not shocking that when you remove all the safeguards, like all of a sudden they're flying to London. Like, I think that's just natural. Um, in, I mean, I mean that, in, and I don't mean that in a, in a flip way. I just mean like when you remove the safeguards, like creep happens and all of a sudden like the training becomes like the leadership training and then the leadership training becomes like, well, London, because we need like a, a quiet place that's removed from the partisan politics. I've read the email that invited people to this and they literally use those words. We need a quiet place away from like the partisan politics of America to like talk about the Magna Carta in August <laughs> in London, <laughs> right? I just think that happens, right? But that's why checks and limits are important because when you pull the strings away, like it happens. And I don't think it's meant, I don't, I truly mean it. I don't think that they're like sitting there like Scrooge McDuck. I just think when you remove all the limits and the rules and the restrictions and the accountability, you get, you know, this. And I don't, and so I just want to make clear that I don't think this is like a true like sacking away money in a, in a pillowcase kind of a situation. All right, we had time for questions. Here are Judge Bebus's rules for questions. You state your name. After that, you get three sentences. They must inform and in substance end with a question mark. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, Ted Brown, great panel. Not going to mention Cypre. Um, <laughs> first, why can't a state legislature, any of the state legislatures, just perform the investigation and oversight? And second, I never heard the words compact clause mentioned. Does that have any impact here, especially with an originalist Supreme Court? All right. Oversight. Who wants to talk about oversight? It is entirely conceivable to me that in the next 12 months you will have a legislative committee come calling when I think when I wrote about the knock on the door. Um, there's a lot of people who would be concerned about this and, you know, it's been an election year and legislatures are part time in our fair states. Um, but I, I don't think there's anything that stops them. I don't think there's anything that stops them. And uh, compact clause. Look, I mean, if I thought this were like actually anywhere near them doing anything formal like that, but it's an unincorporated association in Washington, D.C. where like individual settlements have sent it money, I just think there's like deeper flaws and problems here before you even get there. You know, I think Jonathan is right, uh, sorry, Attorney General's committee is right, that the thing that's gonna drive a lot of this is like, I just don't think this flies under most states' constitutions. I am totally willing to acknowledge that there could be like a wild card state constitution that is totally fine with like money being directed to like this kind of an organization and lent, I mean that. Like that's, our states are different, okay? But I know that there are states that say like public money from public settlements must be distributed into public bank accounts and no, the attorney general cannot borrow against the state or no, they have to record, like there's just a lot of rules in most states. So I just don't think it gets anywhere near the like truly like deeply like compact clause kind of a question. Would either of you like to say anything on either of those? The, the one thing I would add is there's a, there's a level of complication here because although you have negotiations that reach these big settlement agreements, you know, each state individually is contracting with respect to its own liability and it, it, it gets really messy. Um, so I'm going to refrain from going on because I'll just drone on and, and, and the complications uh, are right. too boring for the current All right. discussion. Uh, with respect to the compact clause, this just isn't formal enough. Uh, you know, it's, an, it's a series of ad hoc agreements along with the Kiwanis Club at which we all have conversations about <laughs> these agreements. All right, Mr. Toth, anything you wanted to add briefly? I, I just want to address the issue of um, the idea of states um, violating state law 
when they ask for a grant that they have to repay through a settlement. You know, I'm not an expert on all 50 state laws, and certainly every AG wants to act in concert with their state laws and adhere to them. So if there are conversations to be had with that, they should be had. I don't object to that. But let's back up for a second. Before that state um, asked for that money, maybe they need to look at their own laws and maybe not be the person that's requesting the money, and then the state that's part of the multi-state that doesn't have such a prohibition asks for it. But these are issues for AGs to resolve on a state-by-state -state basis. They're not NAG issues. All right. Sir. Uh, Coach Winehouse from UCLA. Do you think the grouping together of states to um, uh, negotiate with defendants is, by its very nature, conservative in the, for the preservation of the existence and non-liquidation of the defendant in these actions? I have trouble with all the states grouping together. Sorry, I have trouble with all the states grouping together because I just don't see evidence that I have problems with that. I think that what you'll see if you read anything that I've written, what, I'll, what you'll see next week is, I think states should just be far more aggressive in being the primary problem solvers. I just think that if the states moved faster and more aggressively and thought of themselves as first movers, many problems in the consumer space would be resolved and consumers would be better off. Um, I am very pro-AG activity in resolving problems. My gripes are 12-year multi-states over $19 million. You know, Jonathan and I have had a discussion about this many times, and he's probably heard this analogy far too many times. I think states become fixated. The multi-state process becomes fixated on the investigation. It's staff, like 12 layers below a politically accountable elected official, where the investigation is the purpose, case maximization is the purpose, and they'll spend eight years to wring an extra 5% out of an existing $19 million case while they're letting $12 million cases, $50 million cases float by on the ocean not being resolved by the states. That is the thing that bothers me to my core, and I am constantly trying to advocate for more activity because I think states are the best solution um, for how to help consumers in a lot of these cases. All right. Mr. Toth wants to. All right, let's go back to why NAG was formed, 1907, Standard Oil Trust. General Scarametti talked about this very eloquently. It was a very, very powerful force that the AGs knew they couldn't take on themselves. Kind of the elephant in the room here, for me, and I speak not as a former executive director, because I wasn't involved in litigation, but I speak as somebody who observed AG litigation for 18 years. The elephant in the room here is that if AGs act individually, they are much less likely to be successful when they are taking on huge companies that have acted badly. That's what bad actors want. They want to take on states individually. They don't want to take them on together. The reason the tobacco settlement happened is all the states came together. They couldn't have pulled that off individually. Same with the opioid litigation. I, I disagree strenuously, OH. We would not have seen the results if the states didn't band together because when they band together, much like when they banded together against Standard Oil, they are a force to be reckoned with. And as I say again, the AGs are always the underdog here. Even with the, the, the minuscule resources the NAG has, it nowhere compares to the resources that the, the AGs are taking on have. So I think it, it works much to the benefit of the citizens of this country to constituents when the AGs do band together. All I right. think, I just want to point out, this is a really interesting conversation because I think Jonathan makes very good, Attorney General Scrimetti makes very good points about how defendants should prefer NAG, and I think Chris makes very good points about why like individual states have different strengths and weaknesses against companies. And I just want to note that like this first question is a very interesting question that I have strong opinions on, but this is a very philosophically interesting question for another day. Okay, ma'am. Yes. Um, <clears throat> most states have fiscal laws that require all funds to be deposited into the public treasury, and they may not be expended other than by appropriation. Now, you have said in this discussion that the uh, first funding of this goes back to tobacco. How does that congressional law creating this fund override 
the state's responsibility that the money goes into a public fund and may only be expended by appropriation. So I, I can't speak to tobacco other than, you know, maybe there's a supremacy clause interest there. Um, I, I, I really don't, I, I've not done a deep dive on that. With, with respect to the other funds, they don't hit the state coffers. And I think that's been the workaround that people have relied on is you enter this contract to resolve the case, then you have a separate settlement agreement with respect to your specific state's case uh, against the defendant. The defendant sends you mm -hmm. whichever amount of money is allocated of the total money. That's what's reflected in the individual state settlement agreement. And so the, the thinking has been, I keep the money that comes into the state and put that into the general fund or take out whatever expenses the law allows me to reimburse the AG's office for spending and then put the rest into the general fund. But all the other money out there is none of my business. We, we reach the, the global settlement and then we have the separate settlement agreement that's legally binding on the state but that only reflects the portion of money allocated to the state. And so I, there, there's a lot to talk about there, but I think that's been the, the understanding of it by and large. And we have time for our final question. <clears throat> Hans von Spakovsky, the Heritage Foundation. Uh, the real elephant in the room is something you all really haven't talked about. Everything has been about going after big corporations, but the big problem, uh, the other big problem states have is federal intrusion into state sovereignty with huge numbers of federal programs. NAG has been almost totally absent in that, and the organization that has coordinated that is RAGA, the Republican uh, Association. So why would conservative states, uh, why, why should they support NAG instead of sending their dues to RAGA and supporting RAGA? Uh, so first of all, very good points. I will say, and th this is something I've noticed from my colleagues, and it may be, it may be ephemeral, there is a new appreciation for federalism post Dobbs coming uniformly from across the political spectrum. I think the initial shock of the decision in some quarters has been replaced by an appreciation that whatever crazy things Tennessee does, it's not going to affect people in California. Uh, and so I'd, you're going to laugh at me. I'm going to be naive about this. Three years from now, you'll remind me of this, and it will be very embarrassing. I think there's an opportunity to get everybody moving in the direction of looking out for state interests. The federal government scared the heck out of a lot of liberal states when Trump was president. And there are some concerns that we in the Federalist Society have had for decades that are getting more traction on the left. And NAG is an opportunity to keep conversations going. I mean, there are not a lot of opportunities. We're so siloed in so many conversations. And now is the time to evangelize federalism as a principle. I think NAG is a really good vehicle for getting all the states to look into that. And ideally, I would love to see NAG sue the federal government, regardless of, regardless of which party is in power, uh, advocating for state interests, pushing back against federal overreach, and ensuring that our system of separation of powers is taken seriously. Well, General Scrimetti, just to clarify, though, it wouldn't be NAG suing the federal government, it would, I, I, because that's be where some of the confusion of is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I know you know that, but it the, would be the, the, the individual uniform. AGs collectively. Yeah. 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 All right, and with that, please join me in thanking our panel. That was fascinating.